I'm back with uh, Sora Bamari, the op-ed editor of the New York Post and the author of an important book that you should get called The Unbroken Thread. Um, Sora, um, you talk early on in the book about a scenario for your son who's very little, but as he grows up, you know, he becomes kind of this hedge fund guy or this publishing guy. Um, he's into this and that. He's into spirituality and yoga. He's uh, heading off to Europe with his girlfriend. They've got a brand new SUV. Now, many people would say, oh, man, Saurabh, you're, you're really lining up your kid for success. But you say that if this, if, if Maximilian were to do this, you would not necessarily regard it as success. Uh, and part of what you're getting at is that there is an understanding of freedom and of success that we hear from liberalism, and we'll come to the meaning of that term, that you reject. So talk for a moment about why, if Maximilian lived this kind of secular, eclectic, uh, cool, woke life, uh, this is something that would give you anxiety rather than parental pride. Right. And that's the impetus for writing the book is he's named after St. Maximilian Kolbe, who's this great Franciscan friar uh, who was canonized as a saint for laying down his life for a stranger at Auschwitz. And I begin by telling that story and then turning to the scenario that you summarized there of a Max that's um, uh, morally purposeless. He um, has kept his life, uh, his options open his whole life, but it means that he actually hasn't exercise his true freedom. He hasn't bound himself to anything greater than himself. St. Maximilian Kolbe, his namesake, um, in, in a Nazi death camp, exercised this true freedom by, which looks like an apparent surrender, laying down his life for a stranger. And at that moment, he's the freest man in Europe in some sense. Whereas my, my Max, in, in my kind of nightmare scenario, um, you know, he's, he's, he's been dating this girl for 10 years, but they kind of never get married, never have children, which is unfortunately awfully typical of kind of elites uh, in, his, in our milieu today. Um, and so it, it, the paradox is that in the name of freedom, he's never uh, reduced all of his options into one definitive commitment to, to the good life, the truly good life, uh, the married life, uh, family, honor, duty, service, nothing. He's just sort of self serving himself. And that's not an implausible scenario. It's how a lot of our kind of urban liberal elites live today. Let me tell the Maximilian Kolbe story just so people get a clear idea of what you're talking about. The Nazis are almost randomly, they come up to one guy in the group and they go, okay, we're gonna kill you. And the guy begins to cry and scream and say, hey, listen, I'm a, fa I've got, I'm a family man, I've got kids, please don't kill me. Um, and this priest, Maximilian Kolbe, steps forward and he goes, I'll go in his stead. And the Nazis are like, well, okay, and they kill him. And the man lives, right? He, he lives beyond uh, the death camps and he becomes ultimately, I think he was a witness in the um, canonization of Maximilian Kolbe, if I, if I remember correctly. So this becomes then your model. And I think what's really interesting is you're, you're basically saying that ultimately what matters isn't freedom, but how you choose your freedom. In other words, it's the content of your choices, the kind of life you choose to live. It, it, the freedom is merely a procedure that allows you to do that. But you're saying if you make bad choices and you essentially become a celebrator of freedom itself, that's not really the end goal. The end goal is something that's beyond freedom. Am, am I correctly summarizing your thesis? Absolutely, Dinesh. So the account of freedom that you just laid out and which is exemplified in a kind of iconic, overwhelm, emotionally overwhelming way in the life of St. Maximilian Kolbe, is just the pre-modern account of freedom, that um, uh, freedom really means freedom to do what you ought to do, freedom to do, um, uh, freedom to choose for the good. And in fact, free, freedom for, um, for evil is, is, was not called liberty, it was called license. And this, by the way, is a distinction that our founding fathers possessed as well, or at least the more religious ones like John Adams. Um, and uh, you know, the, the idea being that when you're choosing for, for evil, you're degrading yourself, your fellow human beings, you're attaching yourself to these base appetites, and you ultimately become uh, less free. And there's a kind of this paradox where license leads um, to unfreedom, uh, or uh, is, you know, St. John says, you know, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. It's a very short summary of this 
classical and Christian idea of freedom that I champion throughout the book. Yeah, let's push that a little bit to make it a little bit more clear. Isn't the idea here that the human being is a mix of higher and lower impulses? And so, for example, I may have, you know, a, 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 you know, a lust to dominate other people. Or I, may, I may have an appetite for more, more, more. Uh, or I may have, I may be seething with envy or with resentment. And these are part of me, but they're not necessarily the best part of me. And so the idea of self-government is that the, the rational and moral nature of the human being needs to exercise some supervisory authority over these lower impulses, because otherwise, by submitting to them, far from from being more free, you become a creature that is enslaved to those appetites. Isn't that the traditional view that self-government doesn't just mean voting in, in, a, in a democratic system, self-government also means governing yourself? Literally governing the self. And so um, it, it, it is important, it's good to have a, a, a political situation in which uh, you know, there aren't tyrants ruling over the people. Um, but that, that's ultimately in the classical telling broadly speaking, is possible only if the people themselves, first of all, have, um, they can govern the interior tyrant, or they can control the interior tyrant. So that, um, or as St. Augustine says, if you, if you want to have rule over the, the rule of, the, of, of a rational uh, kind of body over the city, that begins with the rule of the citizens' souls over their kind of uh, baser impulses as well. So, yeah, no, you're summarizing that quite, quite rightly. You mentioned Solzhenitsyn in the book, I think, in a beautiful passage where you discuss one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. I'm a little struck by something that Solzhenitsyn says. It's not in the book, but Solzhenitsyn said something like, I was never freer than when I was in the camps, which is to say in these essentially slave camps or concentration camps. But I think what Solzhenitsyn meant is that while they can get to the outward me, they can beat me, they can push me, they can feed me this or feed me that, the inner part of me remains they can't get to that, and I'm in control of that. So to that degree, there's a certain type of freedom that we never give up, even if we're under external subjugation. Yes, and you know, as, as you know, Dinesh, uh, Solzhenitsyn, after he escaped to the West, um, became an exile here, was asked to give this famous commencement address at Harvard in 1978. Um, and a lot of people just expected him to decry the horrors of the Soviet Union, which, of course, he detested and had been helped, helped had done so much to expose. But he spent most of its, uh, this speech criticizing uh, what he saw as the deformation of the Western idea of freedom, which had um, uh, basically habituated everyone to just kind of self-maximize at that low level of freedom that you're talking about and snuffed out the higher part of, higher part of men and women. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in, in the camps, he saw this very clearly in the sense that um, you're in a situation where you're, the range of choices you have in a gulag are very narrow. You, you know, you, you know, you don't get to pick what you eat, what you do during the day. Nevertheless, he saw in these different character types that some people were able to, even within that narrow margin, uh, really kind of shine heroically as, a, you know, and display what it means to be truly human, what it means to be rational, what it means to be moral. And some people, you know, kind of totally give in to the base side of themselves and compound their exterior uh, imprisonment with a kind of interior imprisonment. When we come back, I'm going to talk to Sorab Omari about are we too far gone or can we as a culture recover this higher part of ourselves? We'll be right back. 